Okay, so I'll talk about uh, some very elementary things about uh, smooth maps. Okay, so first we need just to recall, I don't know exactly what everyone's background is. Uh, so just recall a few basic uh, definitions from multivariable calculus. Okay, so what is uh, the derivative of a smooth map between uh, Euclidean spaces, Rn to Rm? So uh, let's just start by recalling what the derivative is for a function from R to R, right? So uh, so if f is a function from R to R, then to say that F is differentiable at a point x means that uh, the limit L, which is limit h tending to zero f of x plus a minus fx over h, this exists. Okay. Uh, so this limit existing is equivalent to saying that there exists a real number L such that uh, if I write this limit as uh, this quantity minus L that tends to zero, so that I can rewrite as fx plus h minus fx minus L times h, the whole thing over h, this converges to zero. Okay, and uh, so this quantity in the numerator, I can think of as an error term. So let me write that as E of H. Okay. So uh, this is equivalent to saying, therefore, that there exists a real number L. So this numerator I was calling E of H. So I can write F in terms of this E of H. So then I get F of X plus H is equal to Fx plus LH plus E of H, where E of H over h tends to zero or in other words e of h is what is written as little o of h as h tends to zero okay fine so uh, so we can say that f is defensible if there exists a real number L, so that F has this following first order Taylor expansion. It is a constant F plus LH, this is a linear function of H, plus an error term, which is small compared to H. So the error term divided by H goes to zero. So, uh, We can also interpret this as saying, therefore, that uh, f near the point x is well approximated by a linear function, LH. The change in f, the change in f is approximated up to first order by a linear function of h, L of a, L times h. This is a linear function of h. Okay. So, uh, so. 
that means you know if i take x plus h here this is the change in f this the change in f is well approximated by a linear function of h okay and the error is small compared to h okay so uh, this last formulation of differentiability this generalizes to higher dimensions so if i have a map f now from rn to rm then i will say it is differentiable at a point x in rn and we don't need it to be defined on all of rn so if it's defined in an open subset of rn taking values in rn we'll say this is differentiable at x in u if so now what we want is the last condition should hold so that uh, the change in f is given by a linear function of h plus a term which is small compared to h so uh, there exists a a linear map from rn to rn such that f of x plus h is fx plus a times h plus e of h uh for h small okay so this makes sense for h small because our domain of f is an open set so x plus h is in is in u for h small uh and what we want is that the error term this e of h so now this is vector valued f takes values in rn so this e of h also takes values in rn this error term what we want is that the norm of e of h divided by the norm of h this tends to zero as h tends to zero so then we say f is differentiable at x so that means that near the point x the change in f is well approximated by a linear function of h some linear map a from rn to rn and this linear map if such a linear map exists then it is unique because if a exists if is unique because if we take any uh vector h in rn which is non zero then suppose that f is differentiable this definition holds so i can look at uh the line passing through x in the direction of this non zero vector h so that line will be given by points of the form x plus th so if i look at f of x plus th minus fx divided by t then using the definition of differentiability i can write this as a of th plus e of th over t and now uh a is linear so this i can write as the t will come out so this becomes just a of h plus uh so i get the e of t of h divided by t so i'll write that as norm h into e of th 
over norm th. Okay. If t is positive, if t is negative, you'll just get a minus sign. No? So, so this last term by the definition of differentiability, e of h, norm e of h over norm h goes to zero as h tends to zero. So over here, uh, the norm of eth divided by norm th will tend to zero as t tends to zero. t is a real scalar here. So this will converge to a of h. Okay. So this means that uh, this A of H is uniquely determined by the values of F. Okay, so the derivative is unique. All right. So I mean, so this uh, this A, this linear map A is unique. We call A the derivative of F at the point X. So uh, this linear map. is called one second. Yeah. So we call A the derivative of f at x in u and the notation for this is df at the point x equal to a okay so now the derivative in one dimension it was just a real number in higher dimensions the derivative at any point x in the domain is a linear map from rn to rm Okay, so uh, so this belongs to the space of linear maps from R n to R n. So I'll write that as L of R n R n. This means the set of linear maps from R n to R n, and this you can identify with uh, m by n matrices. With real coefficients, okay. So the derivative at uh, at a point is a linear map. So let's just look at some simple examples. So example zero, if f is a constant, then f of x plus h minus f of x is 0 since f is constant. So this means as the linear map a you can take a equal to 0. Okay, So the derivative of f at any point is the 0 linear map. So this is a trivial example. Second example is if f is uh, f of x is a linear is a is a linear map AX. Okay, so A is an M by N matrix. Or you could also add a constant to this. So say AX plus B. Then uh, F of X plus H you can see is equal to FX plus A times H. And there's no error term. So this error term E of H is zero. So the change in F is a linear function of H. And so the derivative in this case at all points, the derivative df at x is equal to A for all x. Note that in the definition of derivative, this linear map df at x, uh, just like in one dimension, it could change from point to point. So at each point x, you could have a different linear map df at x. Okay? But for this example, if fx is what's called an affine linear map, that means it's a linear map 
composed with a translation, then uh, the derivative is constant. df and x is equal to this linear math a for all x in Rn. And uh, a third example, which we'll need later, is uh, or what are called the uh, Holomorphic or analytic functions. So these are functions from an open subset of C. So I can identify C with R2, mapping to C, which again I identify with R2. So I can think of these as maps from R2 to R2. So uh, such a map is holomorphic if for all uh, z in u, this limit h tending to 0, f of z plus h minus f of z over h exists. So note here the point is that uh, the domain and the range of f are both the complex numbers. So the numerator f of z plus h minus f of z, this is a complex number. And the denominator h is also a complex number, a non-zero complex number. Uh, so this ratio makes sense as a ratio of two complex numbers, right? because the complex numbers form a field. I can't do this in any other dimensions. If f was going from R2 to R3 or from R3 to R2, it doesn't make sense to divide f of z plus h minus f of z by h. You can't divide. You can't divide a vector in R2 by a vector in R3 or, or vice versa. right? So, or even if it goes from Rn to Rn, where n is not equal to 1 or 2. So it goes from R3 to R3. This doesn't make sense. I can't divide two vectors in R3. So this is a special uh, definition you can make only in dimension 2. So for a map from C to C, we can define this difference quotient. And then we say f is holomorphic if for any z uh, in the domain of f the limit of these difference, these complex difference quotients, this exists. So here h is a complex number which is tending to zero. Okay. So h can approach the origin from all directions. The limit should exist and be the same no matter which direction you approach from. So this, like we did in one dimension, uh, we can rewrite this as saying there exists now an L which is a complex number such that f of z plus h is equal to f of z plus L times h plus e of h where mod e of h over mod h tends to 0 as h tends to 0 in C. Okay. So what does this mean? This means that f is differentiable as a map from R2 to R2. Uh, because this uh, change in f, the, this is a linear term in h, l times h, this is linear in h, but it's not just, so as a linear map from R2 to R2, h goes to l times h, this is not just any 
linear map from C to C, it has the special property that it is a C linear map from C to C. You see, C I can think of either as a real vector space of dimension two with basis one and I, or I can think of C as a complex vector space of dimension one with basis one. So uh, in this case, the linear map that I get from C to C, it is not just linear with respect to real scalars, it is linear with respect to complex scalars. So it is a C linear map. Okay. So what we find is that F is holomorphic if and only if F is differentiable and DF, the derivative of F at any Z in the domain of F, this linear map is actually C linear for all Z in uh, U. So being holomorphic is the same thing as being differentiable as a map from R2 to R2, but with the additional property that the derivative is C linear. So not just real linear. Okay. So, I mean, for example, if you want a, a real linear map from C to C, which is not C linear, you can just take uh, H goes to H bar complex conjugation that is real linear, but it is not C linear. So Z going to Z bar will not be holomorphic. It will be differentiable as a map from R2 to R2, but the derivative will be the linear map H goes to H bar at all points. And that will not be C linear. So it won't be holomorphic. Oh. So in this case, uh, the derivative DF at Z From C to C, this is the linear map. H goes to, uh, so this L is the limit of these difference quotients. So this is written F prime Z. So this is H goes to F prime Z times H. So the derivative is multiplication by the non-zero complex number F prime. Okay. So the derivative is multiplication by the complex number F prime of Z. All right. So these are the few examples of differentiable differentiable maps that I wanted to give. So the next point is how do we find the matrix of DF at a point P? So for this, first I need to look at uh, the partial derivatives. So what are partial derivatives? So F is a map from an open subset of Rn taking values in Rn. So the partial derivative at a point P in U the ith partial derivative will mean you fix all the other i minus 1 coordinates, sorry, all the other n minus 1 coordinates and only vary the ith coordinate. So then f becomes a function of one coordinate. So it's a function of one variable. So then you can differentiate it in the usual sense. And uh, that derivative is called the partial derivative. So formally, the ith partial derivative which is written del f del x i at p, this is defined to be the limit uh, t tends to 0. So t is a scalar, a real scalar. f of x plus t e i minus f of x over t. So over here, this means we're looking at points x plus t e i. That means we're just varying the ith coordinate of x. 
okay keeping all the other n minus 1 coordinates fixed okay and then we differentiate it as a function of one variable so uh like we the same calculation we did when proving the uniqueness of the derivative will tell us that uh, if f is differentiable that implies that all the partial derivatives of f exist and moreover the partial ith partial derivative will be nothing but the linear map df at p applied to ei okay so the ith partial derivative is nothing but the linear map df applied to the i basis vector ei so if uh, f i write as a vector of functions so f takes values in rm so f has n coordinates those are functions from rn to r say let me call them f1 up to fn so f is a vector of functions f1 to fn so then it's easy to see that uh, f is differentiable each of, if and only if each of these fi's is differentiable so f is differentiable if and only if fi is differentiable for all i and uh so then i get an expression for the derivative of f as a matrix so remember when you have a linear map from rn to rm then the columns of the matrix of that linear map are just the images of the basis vectors e1 to en under that linear map okay so df at p has columns dfp e1 up to dfp en okay so uh but now i know what these dfp e1 up to dfp en are these are nothing but the ith partial derivatives of f so this is del f del x1 at p up to del f del x n at p and if i write f as the, the vector of functions f1 up to fn then del f del x i will just be del the column vector del f1 del x i up to del f n del x i so this matrix becomes nothing but the well known jacobian matrix so df at p becomes the matrix del f1 del x1 at p up to del f n del x1 at p okay so this column is dfp of e1 and similarly the nth column will be del f1 del xn of p up to del f n del x n of p okay so this matrix is called the jacobian matrix of f okay so it's a matrix of partial derivatives del f i del x j where f i's are the components of f 
Okay. So now we can make an important definition. So we say that F is C1. So C1 in one dimension meant that F prime exists and is continuous. So in higher dimensions, C1 means that at each point P, I have the derivative is a linear map DF at P. So I can think of it as this matrix, this M by N matrix. So as a function of P, it is a matrix valued function of P. I want that matrix valued function of P to be continuous. So we say that F is C1 if F is differentiable and the map P in U maps to DFP. So this I can think of as taking values in M by N matrices, N, N cross N, R. This map is continuous. Okay. So to say that a matrix valued function is continuous is equivalent to saying that each entry of the matrix is a continuous function of P. Okay, so F is C1. This will imply that all partials of F exist. So the partials will exist because F C1 means F is differentiable. F differentiable means all the partials exist. And now C1 means that this matrix depends continuously on P. So that means each entry del Fi del Xj is a continuous function of P. So therefore F C1 means that all partials of F exist and are continuous. And are continuous. So this is easy, okay? But the theorem is that uh, the converse is also true. Namely, f is C1 if and only if all partials of f exist and are continuous. So this is a theorem. It needs a bit of work to prove this. The point is that uh, just the partial derivatives of f existing does not mean that the derivative exists. It does not mean that f is differentiable. It's easy to give counter examples where, where all the partial derivatives at all points exist, but the function may not be differentiable at all points. Okay, You can easily give such examples. Uh, in fact, it may not even be continuous. Okay. So, uh, so the non-trivial point is that if the partials not only exist, and moreover are continuous. Okay, so the key point is continuity of the partial. So if the partials are also continuous, then actually we can say that F will be differentiable. Okay, that's what you have to prove. If you can prove that F is differentiable, given that the partials exist and are continuous, then once you prove that, then you know that the matrix of F is given by the matrix of partials. And each of those is continuous, so then f is c1. Okay, all right. So this is uh, non-trivial. All right. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is what's called the chain rule. So the setup for the chain rule is this. You have two maps, say f from some u in Rn, mapping to some open subset v in Rm. And then you have some g which maps from there, from V to 
R K. So So we can compose G with F, and what the chain rule says is that if F and G are differentiable, then this implies that the composition G composed F is differentiable, and the derivative of G composed F at a point P, so P is a point in U. Well, what is this? Well, if you think about it for a second, the answer should be not hard to guess. Namely, uh, the derivative of F at P you can think of as the best, the linear map which best approximates F near P. And when I map from P to F of P. And then I compose with G. Then the derivative of G at f of p. This is the linear map which best approximates G near f of p. So then the derivative of G composed f at p. This is the linear map which best approximates G composed f. It should be the composition of the linear maps which best approximate f and best approximate G. So that's what it turns out to be. It turns out to be the derivative of g at f of p composed with the derivative of f at p. Okay. For all p and u. So this is the chain rule. It says that derivative of a composition is composition of the derivatives. Okay. So we won't prove this. Uh, but now I'll give a definition. F from an open subset of R n to an open subset of R n is said to be a C one diffeomorphism. If F is C one and it has a C one inverse, G from V to U. Okay, so in other words, a C one diffeomorphism is a C one map between open subsets of Euclidean spaces, which has a C one inverse. So, in particular, F is a bijection. Okay, it has an inverse, so it's a bijection, and the inverse is C one as well. So, F is C one, and F inverse is C one. Okay, in other words, F is C one. F is a bijection and F inverse is C1. These three conditions mean F is a C1 diffeomorphism. So I define C1 diffeomorphism for maps between one Euclidean space R n to another Euclidean space R n. But actually, if you have a C1 diffeomorphism, then in fact the dimensions n and m have to be the same because. Uh, of the chain rule you see what will the chain rule say the chain rule will say that d dg at f of p composed with df at p this will be d of G composed F at P, and G composed F is the identity map 
G is the inverse of F. So derivative of the identity map. The identity map is a linear map, so its derivative is itself is again identity. So this is just the identity, the identity linear map. So that means that uh, similarly, you can find that if I look at uh, df of some uh, g of q composed with dg of q. This will be G of F compose G of Q. So this will be derivative of identity of Q, which will be identity, where Q is F of P. Q is F of P, so this G of Q is P. So this means DFP here and DFP here. So DFP and DG at F of P are inverses. So DFP and DG at F of P, these are linear maps which are inverses of each other. These are inverses. So in particular, that means that the dimensions have to be the same, right? You have invertible linear maps, so the dimensions must be the same. So you can only have diffeomorphisms between uh, open subsets of the same Euclidean space, Rn. Okay? So you can't have a diffeomorphism from an open subset of R2 to an open subset of R3. Fine. So, uh, so we've seen what the chain rule says is that uh, if f is a C1 diffeomorphism, then at each point the derivative of f, dfp is an invertible linear map. Okay. So now let me remind you of the inverse function theorem, which gives at least locally, a converse to this statement. So the inverse function theorem this states the following. It says that if uh, f is a map from open subset of Rn to Rn, which is a C1 map. So C1 is important here. The inverse function theorem is false for just differentiable maps. You need C1. So if F is a C1 map from Rn to Rn, uh, then if DF at some point P is invertible, so df at p is a linear map from uh, rn to rn. So it's an n by n square matrix. So it could be invertible. So the inverse function theorem says that if the derivative of f is invertible at p, then f itself is invertible in a neighborhood of p. Okay. So more precisely, uh, then there exists open neighborhoods V, W in Rn of P and F of P such that F restricted to V. So this goes, first of all, it maps V to W. And this is a C1 diffeomorphism. So that means F maps a neighborhood of P bijectively onto a neighborhood of F of P, and the inverse is C1. So this is what the inverse function theorem says. So uh, a C1 map 
if its derivative is invertible at a point then near the point the map itself is invertible it and it has a local c1 inverse okay. all right so now let me come to a a generalization of the inverse function theorem which you may or may not have seen this is something called the rank theorem So before stating the rank theorem, let me first talk about a linear map from Rn to Rm where uh, the dimension of the domain n is greater than or equal to the dimension of the range m. Okay. So suppose a from Rn to Rm is linear. Where n is greater than or equal to m. Okay. So we say A has full rank if uh, the rank of A. is equal to the maximum possible possible value m yeah, remember the rank of a linear map is the dimension of its image so to say that the rank is equal to m which is the dimension of the range rm just this is the same as saying that the image of a is all of rm okay so in other words a is a subjective linear map So, an example of a map with full full rank would be the projection from Rn to Rm, where you project onto the first n m coordinates x1 to xm, right? So that's the map x1 comma xn maps to x1 comma xm. Okay. So projection onto the first m coordinates is a full rank map, or just a surjective map from Rn to Rm, and uh, some simple linear algebra will tell you that up to uh, composing with invertible linear maps, actually any any uh, full rank map is of is equivalent to the projection. So, in the following sense, uh, that is, uh, you choose. vi so if suppose that a is full rank so it's subjective so for each basis vector of rm choose a point in the preimage so choose vi in uh, a inverse of pi i goes from 1 to n and let uh, E B the span of D one to V N and F B the kernel of A. So these are both subspaces of R N. Then it's easy to show that. E and F have trivial intersection. So E intersect F is zero. Uh, because 
if some linear combination of the vi's say lambda 1 v1 up to lambda n vn if this is equal to some f in kernel of a then you apply a to both sides that implies that lambda 1 so a of vi is ei so you'll get lambda 1 e1 plus lambda n en equal to a of f and f is in the kernel of a so a of f is 0 but then e1 to en is the basis of rm so if this linear combination of these is 0 then that implies that lambda 1 up to lambda n are 0 which implies that that this vector f which was in the intersection of e and f is 0 okay so these two intersect trivially and uh, and uh, the sum of their dimensions is equal to n right because uh, this tells you in particular that uh, these v1 to vm are linearly independent right so e has dimension m and f by the rank nullity theorem it has dimension n minus m so therefore the dimension of e plus the dimension of f is n and they intersect trivially so therefore e direct sum f is equal to rm so e direct sum f is equal to rm so if we choose a basis for the kernel so if say v m plus 1 up to v n is a basis for uh, f then when i put together these two sets v1 to vm this is the basis of e and vm plus 1 to vn is a basis of f so then the union of these two will be a basis for rn right so then v1 vn union vm plus 1 up to vn this is a basis of rn and now define a map t from rn to rn by saying that this maps this basis v1 up to vn to the standard basis sorry it maps the standard basis to this basis so ei maps to vi okay then t sends a basis to a basis therefore t is invertible okay so then t is invertible and uh, now if i look at my original linear map a composed with this t then this sends ei will go to vi and vi will go again to ei if i is less than or equal to n so this goes to ei for i less than or equal to n because remember a sent vi to ei for i less than or equal to n and uh, for i bigger than n it sends vi to zero this is a basis of the kernel of a okay so ei maps to zero for i bigger than n so what does this mean you put these together this means that a composed t is equal to 
the projection by from Rn to Rn. So any surjective linear map from Rn to Rn is equivalent to the projection onto the first n coordinates pi from Rn to Rn. Okay? Equivalent in the sense that I can find an invertible linear map from Rn to Rn so that A composed with that invertible linear map is equal to the projection pi. Okay? Now, what the rank theorem says is that if I take a C1 map from Rn to Rm, whose derivative at a point has full rank, so the derivative is on 2, then I can find a C1 diffeomorphism from Rn to Rn, from an open set in Rn to an open set in Rn, such that F composed with that diffeomorphism equals the projection onto the first n coordinates. M coordinates. So this is what the rank theorem will say now. So, so it's it's a it's a differentiable version of this linear algebra fact. Okay. So so it says if f from an open subset of Rn to Rm is a C1 map where n is at least n. Then it says that if Dfp at some point has full rank for some P in U, then there exist open sets VW in, uh, in Rn with P belonging to uh, w. So W is a neighborhood of P, and V is some other open set in Rn, and there exists a C1 diffeomorphism phi from V in Rn to W in Rn, such that if I look at F composed phi, then this is equal to the projection. So this is this equation holds on V, okay, where pi is the projection from Rn to Rn. So this means that uh, near a point where the derivative is full rank, the map itself is equivalent to the projection. That means if you pre-compose with some uh, C1 diffeomorphism, then it becomes exactly the projection. Okay? So F composed phi is equal to the projection. So we can quickly prove this. So prove So the proof uh, we follow what we did for the case of a linear map. Okay, so you choose so you choose vi in dfp a uh, pre image of ei under dfp okay so dfp is in, is on two so we can choose a pre image vi for each i i goes from 1 to m and you let uh, e be the span of v1 to vm and you let f be the kernel 
of DFP. Okay. So then, as before, uh, E direct sum F is equal to Rn. And so if uh, we let uh, we let V M plus one to V N we let this be a basis for the kernel of DFP. So for the subspace F. Yeah. Okay, so then that means uh, V1 to Vm union Vm plus 1 to Vm will be a basis for Rn. Now uh, define a map. Uh, psi. So this will go from U subset of Rn, but now Rn I write as E direct sum F, okay? And I'm going to map this to Rn direct sum F. So this abstractly, this is isomorphic to Rn. So I'm going to define a map from Rn to Rn. So I write points of Rn as pairs x comma y, where x is in E and y is in F. Okay, so this stands for the vector x plus y in Rn. So x comma y maps to, so it goes to a pair in Rn direct sum F. So that's the first coordinate will be f of x, y. Okay. So f takes values in Rn. So this is a point in Rn. And the second coordinate will just be y. Okay. So xy goes to f of xy comma y. Okay. Then if uh, so the point is that we can calculate With respect to the basis, uh, so for basis of E direct sum F, I'll take V1 up to Vm union Vm plus 1 up to Vm. So this is a basis of the domain, and as a basis of the range, I'll take. Uh, E1 to Em, this is a basis of Rm union Vm plus 1 Vn. So with respect to these two bases, I can calculate the matrix of D psi at P. So so D psi at P It goes from a direct sum to a direct sum. So this will be a block square matrix, a block matrix. And uh, so how do I calculate the blocks? So if I look at this acting on vectors in E, so that means I just need, so these first N columns will be the derivative d psi p acting on e1 up, acting on b1 up to vm, right? So acting on b1 up to vm, uh, if I uh, vary x in the direction vi, then what I will get is df of vi, df p of vi, comma zero, because the y coordinate doesn't change. 
So that means I'll just get EI. So I'll get E1 to EM as the image of V1 to VM under V side. So here I'll just get identity M zero. And now if I look at the last N minus N basis vectors, then if I vary in the direction VM plus one, then uh, I get, you know, Y plus some T VM plus one that goes to Y plus T VM plus one. So when I differentiate in the ith direction, I'll just get VI. So in the last uh, N minus N columns, I'll get uh, VM plus one up to VM. So with respect to this basis, it will be again the zero comma identity matrix. Okay. So with respect to this basis, this is so you get that the derivative of psi is the identity matrix. So this is invertible. Okay. So therefore, uh, psi has an inverse. So, by the inverse function theorem, there exist neighborhoods uh, VW of psi of P comma P in Rn and a C1 decay morphism phi equal to psi inverse from uh, V in Rm direct sum F. So this I identify with Rm to W in Rm. Okay. So then, uh, psi of phi of x y is equal to x y. But on the other hand, this is by definition of psi, this is f of x, y, comma, y. Sorry, this is f of phi of x, y. So this is f composed phi of x, y, comma, y. Okay? Because phi is an inverse of psi, and using the definition of psi. So this implies that f composed phi of x, y is equal to x. We equate the first two coordinates. So that means that uh, f composed phi is equal to the projection onto the first n coordinates. Right? Okay, this x comma y is the point in Rm direct sum f, and then you are mapping that to x. Okay, so this is the projection from Rm direct sum f to Rm. Okay, so that finishes the proof of the rank theorem. So geometrically, what does the rank theorem tell you? Uh, it says the following. So if I take the point So I have P here, and I have this neighborhood W of P, and F is mapping to some F of P, which is some Q in R M. And what I have is uh, that I have this C1 diffeomorphism phi. 
So that f composed phi, that's this map, is the projection phi from v in Rn to Rn. Okay. So what happens if I look at the inverse image of Q? So the inverse image under f is the same as taking the inverse image under phi and then mapping uh, under pi and then mapping by phi. But the inverse image under the projection pi, uh, that means basically I fix the first n coordinates, right? So that means the last n minus n coordinates. So let me call k is n minus n. So the last n minus n coordinates can vary. So what I get is the inverse image is a copy of Rk inside Rn. Okay, so this is a copy of Rk. This is the inverse image under pi. And then under phi, this goes to some curved copy of Rk sitting here. So this will be f inverse of q. So this phi is a diffeomorphism, right? So in particular, it's a homeomorphism. Phi and phi inverse are continuous. Okay, so what I have is that f inverse q locally, it is homeomorphic to an open subset in Rk. Okay, f inverse q is homeomorphic to an open subset in Rk. So, uh, so actually what we can say is that, uh, so this will lead us to the definition of what are called manifolds, at least uh, manifolds embedded in Rn, okay? So, so I'll get to the definition of manifolds now. So first I just need to say, uh, instead of, C1 mappings, what are CK mappings and smooth mappings? Okay, so, uh, so F from an open subset of Rn to Rn, the definition of CK is that it is CK. Uh, for us, we, our definition will be if all partials of order less than or equal to k exist and are continuous, okay? And similarly, f is c infinity or what's usually called smooth if all partials of all orders exist and are continuous. Okay. So this generalizes our definition of C1 to higher derivatives. All right. Uh, so uh, f from an open subset of Rn to an open subset of Rn is a smooth or C infinity diffeomorphism if uh, f uh, is C infinity and has a C infinity inverse G. Okay, so F is a smooth bijection whose inverse is also smooth. Then we say F is a smooth diffeomorphism or C infinity diffeomorphism. And so these are some basic definitions. Now we can define manifolds in Rn. So
So what is a smooth manifold in Rn? So so for k less than or equal to n. Uh, we say a subset X in Rn is a smooth K manifold or that or manifold of dimension K. We say it's a smooth K manifold. If so locally it looks like RK. So I'll, I'll I'll write down the precise, precise uh, definition, but just a simple simplest example of a manifold which is not Euclidean space itself would be the circle S1. So S1 would be a one manifold inside R2, where locally any small open set in S1 is homeomorphic to an interval in R, right? And similarly, if I take S2, the two sphere in R3. That would be a two manifold sitting inside R3, where locally near any point, if I take a small neighborhood of a point in S2, then it's homeomorphic to a disk in R2. Okay, so a smooth K manifold in Rn would be something which is locally homeomorphic to Rk. Okay, so uh, the precise definition is if for every point P in X. There exists a uh, open uh, VW in Rn with a uh, uh, with P belonging to W. And there exists phi from V in Rn to W in Rn, a C infinity diffeomorphism, such that uh, if I look at phi of so a copy of Rk, so Rk cross zero. So uh, I look at a copy of Rk and I, I intersect this with V. So this is homeomorphic to an open subset of Rk. This maps onto my uh, set X intersected with W. Okay. So for example, for uh, a one manifold sitting inside R2, that will just be a curve actually. A one manifold sitting in R2 is nothing but a curve. So what does it look like locally? Uh, so this is uh, your W inside Rn. And here is your uh, your subset X. So this is X. So this will this part is X intersect with W. This is the point P. So X intersect W is a neighborhood of P in X, right? For the subspace topology on X. And uh, what we have is phi is a diffeomorphism from an open subset V in Rn to this open subset W in Rn such that it maps a copy of Rk. So I have Rk sitting inside Rn. I take Rk intersect uh, V. Okay. Actually, it's Rk cross 0 intersect V, but I'm just writing it as Rk. That's understood as Rk sitting inside Rn. So this copy of so this is an open set in Rk with the subspace topology. 
So what this is saying is every point P in X has a neighborhood in X, which is homeomorphic to an open subset in RK, right? So as a topological space, X is locally homeomorphic to RK. So this is a, a K-manifold, a smooth K-manifold in uh, in Rn. Okay. So how do such smooth K-manifolds come about? Well, you might have guessed that they come about. Uh, one way they come about is via inverse images of points under smooth maps using the rank theorem. Okay, so let me explain that a bit. So to do that, I need to define what's called the uh, regular, regular and critical values of a smooth map. So definition. So if n is greater than or equal to n, and f from u an open subset in Rn to Rn is a smooth map. So we say that P in u is a, a critical point of f if DFP does not have full rank, so rank of DFP is strictly less than M. And we say it is a regular point of F if rank DFP equal to M. All right, so critical points are the points where the rank of DF is less than M. Regular points are the points where the rank of DF equal to M. And uh, we say that Q, a point in Rn, is a critical value if Q is the image of a critical point. Okay. So Q is f of p for some critical point p. And otherwise, it, it is a regular value. So regular value means that Every point in the preimage, uh, all p in f inverse q are regular points. Okay, so no preimage are regular points. Okay, so a regular value means that all the preimages are regular points. And critical value means that some pre-image is a critical point. Okay, so uh, what time is it? Okay, all right, fine. We have time up till five, so it's okay. So, uh, yeah. So let me give you some examples. So. Ah, before that, let me just note that uh, for regular value, we allow the case where the preimage is empty. Okay, a regular value would, could have an empty preimage. That then this is vacuously true. Okay. All right. So uh, Some examples 
one suppose f is a constant c then uh, then all points are critical points so all p in rn are critical points and uh, c is a critical value c is a critical value and any q not equal to c so any q in rm minus c is a regular value Okay, so this is a case where the regular values, all of their clean edges are empty. So in this case, they vacuously they are regular values. Okay. All right. So a slightly less trivial example is if I take the projection pi from R n to R n. Okay. Then in this case, uh, the derivative is just pi again, which has full rank. So this, uh, so all points are regular points, and all values are regular values. So all q and r n are regular values. And three. Now let me take f of z to be. So let me take a complex polynomial, z cube minus three z. So this I think of as a map from C to C. Uh, so in this case, what are the critical points? So remember, the derivative of f is multiplication by f prime z. F in this case is a holomorphic function. F prime z is three z squared minus three. So that's three into z squared minus one, or three into z plus one into z minus one. So df at z, this is the linear map from C to C. Multiplication by f prime z, right? This is the linear map from C to C. H maps to f prime z. That's a complex number times h, which is a complex number. So, uh, so at the points where f prime is non-zero, then this linear map is invertible, right? It's multiplication by a non-zero complex number. So it's an invertible linear map from C to C. So, the points where f prime z are non-zero are regular points, and the critical points will be the points where f prime z is zero, right? Because then df becomes zero. So, the critical points are z equal to so the zeros of f prime, so one and minus one, and the critical values. The critical values are nothing but the image, the images of the critical points. So f of one and f of minus one. So one maps to one minus three. That's minus two. So the critical values are minus two and plus two. Okay, f of minus one will be plus two. Okay, so this has exactly two critical values: minus two and plus two. All other points are regular values. All right. Okay, fine. So now. Uh, that we understand these examples. Uh, let me state a theorem. Which will explain how uh, manifolds in Rn arise via uh, pre-images of smooth smooth maps. Okay, so theorem. 
suppose n is greater than or equal to n, and f from an open subset in R n maps to R n is a smooth map. Uh, so it says that if q in R n is a regular value of f, then f inverse q, so x equal to f inverse q subset of Rn, this is a smooth k-manifold. So the inverse image of, uh, yeah, it's a smooth k-manifold where k is equal to n minus n. So k could be 0 if n is equal to n, then it will just say that uh, uh, it's a zero-dimensional manifold, just means a discrete set of points. It's just a discrete set of points. Okay, so the pre the preimage of a regular value is a manifold in Rn of dimension n minus n. Okay? And uh, there's nothing to prove this follows immediately from the rank theorem because uh, what does the rank theorem say? You see, we're looking at a point in, we're looking at x equal to f inverse q. So if I take any point p in x, then I know that df uh, at p, because p is a, uh, it's the inverse image of a regular value, therefore it is a regular point. That means df at p has full rank. So by the rank theorem, I can find neighborhoods, a w containing p and a c1 diffeomorphism phi from some v in Rn to w which maps uh, so such that uh, f composed phi is equal to the projection phi. And so, so this maps to q, which is f of p in Rm. And as we saw in the, after the proof of the rank theorem, phi will map a copy of Rk intersect V, it will map that to X intersect W, right? This will be X intersect W. So this is exactly what we had in the definition of smooth manifold of dimension K in Rn, okay? All right, so inverse image of a regular value is a smooth K manifold in Rn. And we can easily give applications of this. So, for example, example, I take f of x to be norm x squared. Okay, so f is a function from Rn to R, okay. and then uh, I put x equal to f inverse 1. So f inverse 1 means the x such that norm x squared is 1. In other words, it's the unit sphere, Sn minus 1. This is a, a manifold of dimension n minus 1 manifold by the previous theorem because one is a regular value of f. Why is that? Because uh, if I take a pre-image, so if I take p in f inverse 1, so then um, 
norm p is equal to one, so p is a non-zero vector, and dfp. will be just the row vector of partial derivatives. So this is summation xi squared. So when I differentiate with respect to xi, I'll get 2xi. So I'll get 2x1 up to 2xn. So this is just 2p. So dfp is just 2p, the vector 2p. Or 2p transpose, if you like, if you think of p as a column vector. So this is non-zero. So therefore, it has full rank. Right? The, Full rank just means the rank of df should be 1. So this is rank 1. Okay. So that means the n minus 1 sphere in Rn is, is a manifold. Okay. A, a more interesting example, which I won't do, but I leave it to you as an exercise, is if you take the orthogonal group. So this you can realize as an inverse image of the map which sends a square matrix A to uh, A transpose A. So here you have to be a bit careful. F it maps n by n matrices into well, it maps it into n by n matrices, but you don't take all the n by n matrices if you want to map with full rank. What you have to do is take all symmetric matrices. The image here is symmetric matrices. So take symmetric matrices. So sim n by n symmetric matrices, n by n symmetric matrices. So this is a vector space of dimension n times n plus 1 over 2. And this is of dimension n squared. Okay. So what you can show is that uh, if I look at the orthogonal group, ON, this is f inverse of the identity matrix. Okay. And this will, what you can show is that the identity matrix is a regular value of f. And so the inverse image, which is the orthogonal group, becomes a manifold of dimension uh, n times n minus 1 by 2. Sitting inside r to the n squared. Okay? So that this is a less trivial example. You can try and work this out for yourself. Okay. Fine. So now moving on. Yeah. So now I want to define Okay, so let me uh, wrap up quickly. So I want to define tangent spaces. To a manifold. So if P is a point in X. So then I have this picture. Here's my X. Here is P. Um, this is W in Rn. And so I have this diffeomorphism phi, which maps a copy of RK, and let's say it maps 0 to P. Okay. So we define the tangent space TPX to be the image under D phi. d phi 0 of rk. So that will give me some subspace of Rn of dimension k, which you think of as tangent to, you think of it as tangent to, to, uh, to x. So if, if x is the two sphere S2, then this tangent uh, plane, this tangent space will be nothing but the tangent plane to the sphere at any of its points. Okay. 
so this is defined to be the image under the derivative of any such diffeomorphism phi. So this phi is called the parametrization okay, of x. So this is a parametrization. So you take any parametrization which maps zero to p. Okay, so phi of zero is p. And then you define the uh, tangent space to be this uh, image of Rk, the subspace Rk under D5. So this is equal to a k-dimensional subspace of Rn. And it's not hard to see that this is independent of the choice of parametrization. If I take a different parametrization, say some psi, so psi goes from some other open set in Rn to, to V, uh, to W, so from some V prime, then I can look at uh, the composition of these two diffeomorphisms. So, uh, so psi I can write as this diffeomorphism. So this will be, uh, this one will be phi composed. So H equal to uh, phi composed with, no sorry, phi inverse composed with psi. Yeah, phi inverse composed with psi. So this is a diffeomorphism from Rn to Rn, which maps Rk to Rk. So then I can write uh, psi as phi composed with H. Okay. And so if I look at uh, um, H, then H it maps RK, this copy of RK to this copy of RK. So therefore DH of 0 of RK will be contained in RK because H maps RK to RK. And uh, so this implies if I look at D psi of 0 of RK, by the chain rule, this is D phi at 0 of dh at 0 of rk and dh at 0 of rk is contained in rk so this is contained in d5 0 of rk and similarly i'll get the other inclusion if i look at the map going the other way h inverse then i'll get that d5 0 of rk is contained in d psi 0 of rk so therefore both of these are equal okay so independent of which parametrization I choose, I get a well-defined tangent space. Fine. Uh, so now I want to talk about smooth maps between manifolds. So, if f is a map from x, a manifold, so x is a k manifold in Rn, so I'll write it as xk in Rn, to some y is an L manifold in Rn. So, this is said to be smooth. If uh, for all P and X, there exists, so if I take any point P and X, then uh, there exists a neighborhood W uh, of P in Rn and there exists a smooth map uh, 
capital F. So this is from an open subset in Rn mapping to Rm such that F capital F restricted to uh, W intersect X is equal to F restricted to um, X intersect W. So restricted to this piece of X, uh, F is equal to some capital F, which is defined on the whole of this open set in RF. In other words, little f, which was defined only on x, locally it extends to a smooth map in a neighborhood in Rn. So then we say that f is smooth. And then we can define the derivative of f, of little f. So if p maps to a point q, which is f of p, then the derivative of f at p is defined to be a linear map between these tangent spaces. From so the derivative written little df at p. So this is the map from tpx to tfpy is defined to be just uh, the derivative of capital F. So d capital df at p. Okay. So the point is because capital F maps x into y. It's not hard to see that if I differentiate along curves in X, those will go to curves in Y. And so their tangent vectors, which are elements of the tangent space in, in X, will map to elements of the tangent space in Y. And so uh, capital DF of P will map TPX to TP, TFPY. Okay? So this defines a linear map between the tangent spaces, which is called the derivative of the smooth map, little s. Okay? Fine. So I'm not going to check that. Uh, you can work it out. It's quite easy. So now we can define similarly what is uh, so if f is again from some k manifold. To some L manifold, where now K is bigger than or equal to L. Okay, F is a smooth map. So we say that uh, P in X is a regular point if uh, DF P. So from TPX to TFPY, this has full rank. This has full rank. Okay, so that means rank of DF at P is equal to L, the dimension of Y, which is the dimension of the tangent space. And you say that uh, Q in Y is a regular value of F if all P in F inverse Q are regular points. Okay, so the notion of regular values generalizes to smooth maps between manifolds now. So then we can prove quite easily the same theorem that we proved for maps between uh, Euclidean spaces. The theorem is that uh, for f as above, uh, for q in y, a regular value implies f inverse q is a manifold of dimension k minus l. Okay. So this will now be a, a manifold sitting inside x, which sits inside Rn. 
So it's actually what's called the submanifold of X. Okay? This will be a K minus L dimensional submanifold of X. Okay, good. So finally, to finish off in the last uh, five, ten minutes. We will give an application, which is a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra using the concept of regular values. So, uh, so let's look at the case where x, y are compact manifolds in Rn and k is equal to L. Okay. So, if uh, q in y is a regular value, uh, then if I look at f inverse q, so this is a manifold of dimension k minus l, which is zero dimensional. So it's a discrete set of points. So it's a discrete subset of x, and x is compact. So it's a closed and discrete subset of x, so it's compact and discrete, so it's finite. Okay, so then f inverse q is compact, discrete, hence finite. Okay. Moreover, this cardinality of f inverse q is Uh, locally constant on the set of locally constant on the set of regular values. Uh, so why is this? Because what you can do is so you take Q, this is sitting inside Y, and so by the inverse function theorem for maps between manifolds, here it's a regular value. So it's a pre-image is discrete, it's finite. So you get finitely many pre-images, P1 to Pn, and each of those has a neighborhood which maps say some u1 up to un, these map diffeomorphically onto some neighborhood v in of q in y. Okay, So these are neighborhoods in x mapping diffeomorphically under f to some neighborhood v of uh, q. Okay, So f inverse q equal to p1 to Pn, and you have F maps Ui containing Pi to V containing Q as a diffeomorphism. But now uh, X is compact, so if I look at F of X minus U1 union Un, so I look at the union of these neighborhoods in X. So that's some open subset. So its its complement is uh, is closed. So its complement is compact. So the image is compact. So the image is closed. And so if I look at y minus this, so if I look at v minus this, f of x minus u1 to un, then this will be an open set in y. And moreover, it is a neighborhood of Q. So let me call this V prime. So this could be some smaller open subset V prime. So this is V prime. Okay, this contains Q because I've removed uh, the the images of uh, the complements of U1 to UN. So this is an open neighborhood of Q, and if I take any 
uh, Q prime in V prime, then it's easy to see that F inverse Q prime is contained in the union of the UIs. Right, because uh, I've removed the the images of the complements of the UIs. So if something is in V prime, it cannot be in the image of the complement of the UIs. Therefore, it must be in the image of images of the UIs. So, so F inverse Q prime must be contained in the union of the UIs, which means that F inverse Q prime I can write as the union of uh, F inverse Q prime intersect UI, okay? And uh, F inverse Q prime intersect UI, well, Q prime is a point in V, right? So in each UI, F from UI to V is one to one onto. So in each UI, Q prime has exactly one pre image, some P, PI prime, okay? So this, is a singleton. Okay, so that means that cardinality of F inverse Q prime is equal to N also. Okay, so that means the cardinality of the pre image stays constant in a neighborhood of a regular value. Okay, fine. So using this, finally, we can give a proof of the fundamental theorem of algebra. So if I have a polynomial P of Z is A naught Z to the D plus A D. So P goes from C to C. Then uh, you can think of this by a, a stereographic projection from C to, uh, so if I look at phi plus, phi plus is stereographic projection from C to S2 minus the North Pole. Okay, so it maps a point to the intersection of the straight line joining that point to the north pole with the sphere. Then I get a map F, which is uh, phi plus P, phi plus inverse. So this goes from S2 minus N to S2 minus N. And what you can show, this is not hard to show, this extends to a smooth map from S2 to S2, okay, where the North Pole maps to the North Pole. So the North Pole corresponds to infinity, okay. So for a polynomial of degree D, as Z tends to infinity, P of Z tends to infinity. So that will tell you that as you tend to the North Pole, F of P will tend to the North Pole. So this extends to a smooth map you can show. And uh, the point is F has finitely many critical points. Because the critical points just correspond to the points where the derivative of P vanishes. So P is a polynomial, so it has, P prime has finitely many roots. So, so F has finitely many critical points, hence uh, the set of critical values is also finite. So it has finitely many critical values. So let me call the set of critical values, say C, okay? So then S2 minus C is the sphere minus a finite set. So this is connected. Okay, so this is the set of regular values. This set of regular values is connected 
but I saw that for the regular values, the pre-image of a point was finite and its cardinality was locally constant. But a locally constant function on a connected set has to be actually constant. Right? So cardinality of f inverse q is locally constant on, on the regular values. But the regular values are connected. Hence, this is constant. So f inverse q, cardinality of f inverse q is some integer n greater than or equal to 0. But if n is equal to 0, then that means all the regular values, their, in, their pre-images are empty. Then that means f takes values only in the critical values. But then that means f takes values in a finite set. Then that means that polynomial p takes values in a finite set. But that's a contradiction, right? A polynomial takes infinitely many values. So therefore, n has to be at least 1. Okay, but then that means that all of the regular values are attained, are in the image of f. Okay, all of the regular values are in the image of f. So the image of f contains S2 minus a, a finite set. But the image of f, f of S2 is a compact set. So it's closed. So it's a closed set which contains S2 minus a finite set. Therefore, it contains all of S2. Therefore, f is on 2 from S2 to S2. And hence, p from C to C is on 2. So therefore, your polynomial p has a root. Okay. All right. So I'll finish here. Thank you.